strike of a light pole. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tyco. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. I was supposed to ask about, like, we don't have these, we've never done a section like this before, where you have this sort of take the vehicle from spot to spot to spot to spot. Where did this come from, exactly? So, uh, uh, in the original design of this game, we were going to do racing again. Uh-huh. And uh, the, we had made this, this buggy that could drive and shoot, and that was going to be the racing vehicle for the game. But uh, uh, we racing got cut at some point when we realized how impossible making this game was anyway. Uh, I'm pretty sure racing got cut before we actually did any of the racetracks. Yeah. Well, no, there so, there was one uh, racetrack that was fully arted. Uh, it was arted, but we hadn't actually started any of the gameplay on it. Yeah, we, we had a buggy and we had the racetrack, but that was about it. Right. We hadn't actually done any gameplay on any of the racetracks. But, the, but we did art up the one in Florida. Yeah, exactly. And though, so that that was there, and then we decided to cut it. And uh, uh, space combat was in the game before we cut it. Right. So there was there was a bunch of features that got you know uh, a, a lot of attention put to them and then cut. There was a lot of drama so that... around the space combat too. Man. Oh boy. <laughs> that's and I don't think we can. True. I don't think we can talk about the space combat. <laughs> like to actually think... tell about the the whole entirety of the drama. Yeah, I don't think we can I, talk I... about that on camera. Maybe we'll have to talk around some of it, but I think, you know, at some point we can mention, uh, you know, just the, the what it was going to be like, you know, because uh, I still remember that. Oh, well, yeah, I mean, maybe at some point. I don't remember too much about what the design was. All I remember was that we gave it a, a honest effort, a real go, and after a lot of work had been done, we were just kind of like, we can't do this. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was just way too much but in the case of this level we had the uh, you know we had the buggy already and we wanted to do stuff with it and we had these giant battlefield levels that were always uh, uh, intended to be part of the design and so we're like oh let's use the buggy and that'll get you around these giant levels a lot faster and we could do some non-linear gameplay you know uh, uh, you can go to these objectives in any order and it, it just sort of was a new feeling for a ratchet level right but uh, the fact that it was, you know, brand new and we'd never done it before, was was part was a huge problem with this level. I mean, just getting people to figure out where they were supposed to go and learn how to use the uh, uh, the, the radar down at the bottom and all that was just it was a big deal. So uh, these levels, while in the end were very successful, this particular one was very hard to actually get right. So. Um... This might be a, a seem like a bit weird, uh, but we haven't touched on the multiplayer too much yet. But right. I think now is a pretty good time to at least start talking about the subject. I, if you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but I think when we first approached this game, we were just kind of like, "Let's make these battlefields, and let's make that sort of the natural extension of what Ratchet's going to be." Right now. When did multiplayer start factoring into the conversation? Because I don't know, I don't realize, I don't remember if we thought going in that multiplayer would be a good idea, or we saw the what we were doing with the battlefields and realized that that would be a good way to work the multiplayer in. Like I don't remember how, which you know, it's a chicken or the egg thing. I don't, I, I right. think we were at least talking about how it would be nice to have multiplayer, but the battlefield sort of really gave us that sort of place where we could actually make it work right if if uh if i remember correctly sony actually requested multiplayer uh they had they had just released the playstation you know broadband uh ad adapter yeah the modem and it and uh socom was actually doing pretty well with it uh so uh normally what will happen is when when uh, a publisher wants to or you know or a platform holder wants to push some of its hardware They'll ask a, ask developers to make you know uh, killer apps for it, right? Like make something so that people will want to buy this. And Ratchet was a, a really popular franchise that that Sony owned. So at that point, you know uh, all of the games were being asked to include multiplayer if they could make it work. 
And so, you know, we're like, yeah, we could totally make it work. Let's do it. Why not? I mean, this game is already three times bigger than the last game. Why, why not add multiplayer and, uh, you know, and so forth. So, I mean, multiplayer uh, was probably one of the reasons why, uh, you know, a number of those other giant features got cut, right? It was multiplayer is so big. Yeah, I mean, we had a dedicated multiplayer team, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we had... It was uh, Eric? A Eric... Uh, Eric and I think Heather was there at that point. I don't. Was she uh, on multiplayer? I thought so. Uh, I know Mark and, uh, was on multiplayer. Eric, right. Mark, and Andrew. I think were was on him or was was it Andrew? Uh, I know by the time Resistance came around, Orion was on the team. I don't remember if he was on uh, if he was on it on the on this one. I, you know what? I can check Moby Games and find out. That's fine. I'll, I'll post a little. Uh, <laughs> A little thing, just like, yeah, Mike was right. But yeah, there was a lot. I mean, there was a dedicated multiplayer team. Is it, Are we about to do the Vomiturno battle? We are, yeah. Oh, let's watch this. I, I remember this cutscene took Jared forever to do. This is a programmatic <laughs> driven cutscene, I believe. Yes, it took yeah, I believe forever you're right. To get that exactly right. And then into this transition. Like, it turned out really well, considering it was done by a programmer. And you don't even have to add that caveat to say that it looks really good. But yeah. it was done by a programmer, and I got to give him props for Because that. normally those those sorts of cameras are laid out by uh, animators, right? Or Right, who know how to make things look good. Right. And so the fact that it looked so good and and was all done in code is is even more impressive. Yeah, I think that's I think he did a really good job with that. And I think he was really proud of... Uh, I think this was one of Jared's first big tasks on the game, too. And I think it did a really good job. I mean, there was a lot of back and forth as to how this battle was going to go and uh oh yeah it was changed a number of times uh i remember uh brian algar was the one who designed it and uh i remember there being at least two or three iterations on this guy yeah you know it's funny that you talk a lot about how uh we steal a lot of our puzzle cues from zelda uh -huh. but like this is this is a very Zelda boss. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It is, isn't it? I mean, the fact that he, like, jumps up on the walls and does... All, like, he is... This is probably the most Zelda boss that we've ever sort of really done in the game. Yeah, it's... it's I, I mean, that, that boss intro is, like, straight out of Zelda. Oh, shit! <laughs> oh, dude, he did bullet time. Yeah, he did a... I, this is crazy, the stuff he did. And then he... They, this part is insane. I don't know how he managed to get this working. This part is unbelievable that you have to do this sort of perspective from the boss. This was like, it's screwed with a lot of people too, man, because to have the camera this far pulled away looking at Ratchet, like this was really trippy to a lot of people. What was trippy about it? It's just, we don't shoot Ratchet from this perspective that often. Right. And like the fact that you don't have control of the camera anymore kind of throws people off and I do remember I, having a lot of trouble with it in the in the user testing yeah uh, but I don't remember many specifics I I think I was uh, uh, you know absorbed into my own little crunch world of pain and agony at that point well I just remember that this was so much back and forth because he's like his those phase transitions are so uh, difficult to pull off and you're basically coming to a whole new area and it all has to sort of flow together and work really well. Like, there's a lot that goes into that to make that work. And especially given the constraints of the engine. I mean, uh, our, the engine we had at this point didn't make doing stuff like that easy. No, not at all. I mean, the engine was very much uh, uh, designed to do normal ratchet gameplay, you know? Like, yeah. Very Like, real sort of shooting gallery, arcade -y almost. Uh, style of run and gun and uh, to do those sort of cinematic Zelda fly through cameras he stomped on his eye oh and it's Darla Gratch you, you know I so I don't know I don't think we told the story before but I like this story a lot because I think it was one of the first interactions we ever had uh, with Oliver back when we were testing okay um, so back on Ratchet and Clank 1 there is that uh the Darla Gratch is in Ratchet and Clank 1, and so she is 
uh, doing uh, her news report, like when the Amoeboids are taking over and rushing things. Yes, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> and then she appears later in the game to do another news report or whatever. After being eaten by an Amoeboid. After yeah. eat, being eaten by the Amoeboid. And so when we, we, I remember we collectively came up with this idea and we pitched it to Oliver. Like, hey, wouldn't it be hilarious if the second time you saw Darla Gratch, instead of it was her, it was the Amoeboid holding the microphone. Doing <laughs> to its doing stomach or something, right? Exactly. <laughs> I and remember we that. It was great. We walked up to Oliver and we're like, Oliver, this would be hilarious. We have to do that. But we had not worked in games before, and the cutscene was done. Like we saw the cut, the second cutscene, and we're like, oh, you should change it to do this or whatever. And Oliver was incredibly professional. Like he was more professional about it than I would have been, because <laughs> he was just like he was really gentle right. with us. Yeah, he was really gentle. He was like, that's a great idea. That's really funny. But we're not going to do that. <laughs> and I was just like, and I was like so disappointed because like that would be hilarious. But he was so gentle about like instead of being like, you realize that the cutscene is done and now we're not going to redo the cutscene for your stupid idea. Well, he did. He did. I would have said he did kind of explain. You know, uh, it costs a lot of resources to do these things, and you know the the fact that it's and you know we have to go on and do the rest of the scenes. We don't have time to go back and visit it. Yeah. Uh, so you know we got a nice little education, but. It was, uh, yeah, it was incredibly gentle. I'm considering. Considering <laughs> there's a bunch of, a couple of taskers coming up, like, here's how you should do your job. He was very, he was very polite about it. I remember, uh, like, I think, uh, you know, given that we were some of Insomniac's first testers they ever hired, uh, like, we, we probably had a lot easier time of it than some other testers did. Uh, you know, like... I, I never felt like I wasn't part of the team. Like, everyone was real nice, and they explained things, and it was just sort of a really cool experience. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, like uh, you know, get, getting to go back and forth with Jason Skiles on uh, uh, you know, <laughs> various bugs that we found to make his life a living hell. Yeah, or, he, he always appreciated that. Or uh, finding bugs that Roberto would claim weren't his. I don't think we ever actually successfully pinned one on him. Uh, well, I mean, we got one on video <laughs> per, per the commentary. Oh, yeah? So, I mean, that's as good as it's going to be. All right. <laughs> He'll probably still say it wasn't him. Probably. I think those are them. I think that's the Rockets. Oh, are those the... That's the... Those are the Rockets! <laughs> are they... Uh... So, so, those Rockets, that is the Snow Beast Award winning Rockets for Ratchet and Clank 3 <laughs> up your arse. And uh, uh, what was it that made them beat out all the rest of the... Who hated them so much. <laughs> like, every single time he had to play a level with those rockets in there, he would just start yelling and screaming about how much he hated those rockets. And how... And I don't think a day went by that he didn't plead with Carl to please change them and just make them not behave the way they behave. <laughs> they have this arc where they're coming at you at a certain speed, uh -huh. and then at the last possible minute, they change their path and come at you in a different way. Yeah. So oh. your timing, oh, like you're getting, shit. you're getting hammered by them. Oh, because fuck. You, you have this timing in your head about when they're going to arrive. And then at the last possible moment, that switches on you. Right, right. And it really messes you up. Like, in just this, because you're not, I don't think you realize how reflexive video games get for people after a while. Uh-huh. Or I don't think a lot of people realize how reflexive games get for people for a while. And a lot of it's just sort of anticipation and figuring, okay, I know when he's going to, this is all about getting conscious subconsciously for people. They know when it's going to arrive and they know all this sort of stuff. And even the slightest adjustment to that sort of subconscious processing of when things are going to arrive and hit you can really mess with your head and just be like, that's not when it was supposed to arrive. And those rockets had that sort of effect on Moo, right. where he could never get the rhythm down on those things because he would always be surprised by the last minute change in, in their path. Right, because normally if you were doing a... a a rocket that had that kind of behavior, you know, it'd be more like the mortar attack in uh, in the boss fights, you know? Like, it gives you some warning, 
you know what to expect, you you know exactly what the game's asking you to do, and then you do it, and you're fine. But in these, you respond to what you think the game is asking you to do, and instead, you get hit and die, and it feels, you know, unfair. Right. It, and they come right down on top of you. <laughs> like, they leave, they leave the view of the camera to come down and hit you in the head. And it's just like, it seems so unfair <laughs> that it that this thing from off screen comes and hits you. But it is unfair, yeah. I mean, there's not, it's not even a seeming problem. It, it's a real problem. Yeah, I mean, I think there was... So, I think there was a very good line. I think it was from uh, Jeff Kaplan on the World of Warcraft team at Blizzard. Okay. And I think this was something he said at BlizzCon or... I'm sure a lot of people have said this, but I think he phrased it particularly well. And people were like talking to him about why the boss fights in World of Warcraft weren't harder. Oh, right. Like, why don't and, you target the healers first? Or, right. Yeah. And he was just like, look, making something hard is not difficult. It's making something fun that's difficult. Yeah. Like, if you just wanted something hard, we could crap that out <laughs> immediately. Like, that's no time at all. To make something hard, and it'll take you a long time to beat. Oh yeah, it's it's, uh, it's really easy to make something hard, but making right. something fun and difficult is very different. Yeah, that was the same problem we had with the snow beasts, right? It's it's like, it's not that we want the snow beasts to be easier. It's just the way that they are difficult is incredibly frustrating. Right, right. To people. Now people are wrong for complaining about the snow beasts <laughs> that, that, that way, but I mean it's the same sort of idea. And that's sort of why the Rockets were sort of a, a fine second annual winner to the Snow Beast Award. Because it has the same sort of sort of problem. It's that they're difficult in a very frustrating way. And so for the second annual Snow Beast Award winner, I offer a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! Good job. Good job to Carl. <laughs> uh, I don't remember who won it after that. I mean, was it Duncan or... Uh, well, I left as soon as Rat to Deadlock wrapped up. Oh, so you don't know who like, won it for Deadlocked. Like, on the day we went gold, I think I was like, all right. Uh, and that was my last day. I think uh, I think it was a designer actually got it on Deadlocked. So I think, okay. I think it even switched departments, which is kind of crazy.